How does GM plan to use hydrogen fuel cells? Welcome back to Tech to Nation. I'm Fred Fishkin. With us from GM is Charlie Fries, global head of GM's hydrotech business. Thanks for joining us, Charlie. Great to be here. Well, give us the description here of what the hydrotech business is. Well, it's kind of like a company within the company. Um, GM is making hydrogen fuel cells. We've been doing that for well over uh, 50 years, all dating all the way back to actually the 60s when we did the first hydrogen fuel cell vehicle in the Electrovan. But what's different today is now we're in the process of commercializing the technology. So it's really evolved in a pretty dramatic way. And we find that it has a, a great opportunity moving into uh, support our zero, zero, zero vision at GM, which is zero emissions, zero congestion, zero crashes. And to get to that zero, 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 we need to have a technology that can not just service the smaller vehicles with electrification, but also service the largest of all the vehicles, the ones that carry heavy payloads, travel long distances, need the range, need a lot of energy on board. And that's really where hydrogen fuel cells come into play. That's interesting. So, I mean, Obviously, I'm not driving a hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle. And uh, GM is announcing, as all the automakers are, electric vehicles, EVs. So describe for us so that we can all understand where the hydrogen fuel cells will fit into the picture. And I guess it's it's beyond the vehicles themselves. So tell us. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's interesting because batteries are a very efficient way of moving vehicles and, and uh, they're over 93% efficient. So the, the great advantage of the battery is it can produce a lot of power. And if you're moving the, the smaller vehicles, like we drive every day with our drivers, you know, to get to work and school and, and to the grocery store, that's perfect. And even when you get into the larger vehicles and you start talking about vehicles that are hauling, let's say delivery vehicles is a great example. If they're hauling half empty Amazon boxes or, potato chips is a great application to apply batteries. But if I start hauling really heavy payloads, now if we're talking about liquids or steel, things like that, and I wanna haul long distances and I can't afford the time at either end of the beginning or the destination location to recharge the batteries, that's where hydrogen can play a really unique role. It can give you that zero emissions, electrified, more efficient propulsion system with no, no emissions other than water vapor. And we can also give you the ability to get the range, so hundreds of miles uh, beyond what you can achieve with the batteries without compromising the payload of the vehicle and also doing it with a very fast refueling time. So we're talking minutes instead of hours. And that's a big advantage because if you're using commercial vehicles and you make money when the wheels are turning, you need to keep the wheels turning. So we've announced over the last 12 months some applications that are really interesting in their ability to do that. One is a collaboration we're doing with Navistar to apply the hydrogen fuel cells with our Hydrotech technology into the Class A trucks. So two of them would go into a Class A truck application. We have, we've also announced with a collaboration with Wabtech, which is locomotives. So these are big uh, locomotives on the rails. And now if you take that same technology that goes into a Class A truck and use maybe somewhere between eight and 25 of these, you can power a three megawatt locomotive. And that gives you the ability to put clean technology on the rails. Again, big vehicles hauling heavy payloads, long distances that need fast turnaround. All of that can be achieved with the hydrogen. And then we've also got another collaboration applying the technology to aerospace. And that's with Weed Bear Aerospace to develop a replacement for the turbine in the back of the aircraft that is the auxiliary power unit and instead doing it with a clean hydrogen technology that's quieter, more efficient, um, takes the emissions out of the picture. So that's, a, that's a, yet another very different application. And more recently, last week, we announced uh, a, an announcement with Renewable Innovations to develop our hydrotech fuel cell systems into stationary and mobile power. And that really opens up a brand new world for clean energy, where we can start to think about putting electricity at different points where you might have to do DC fast charging for electrified vehicles and you don't have the ability to do upgrades to the grid or you don't have the time for the permitting, you want to get something out there very quickly, or backup power systems maybe for um, if you think about a hospital or um, a school or a police station, places that could be affected by things like rolling blackouts in California. Those would all be great applications for a zero emission fuel cell generator. Very, very interesting. So uh, a hydrogen fuel cell generator could actually recharge electric vehicles in, in certain circumstances, is what you're saying. Yes, exactly. And, and what's interesting about it is you can do it because it, it's, 
it's portable, right? So I can put the hydrogen fuel cell system on board a trailer, or I can put it on a skid and I can locate it at different locations. You don't have to rip up the pavement and run uh, new power drops off of the grid or install new panels. Instead, you could have a system like the one that we're talking with, uh, um, if, you, if you look at the Empower system that Renewable Innovations is developing, um, that's a great example of putting very high power density into a site. So now I can have uh, four uh, EVs charging at all the same time with DC fast charges. And I could do that for, let's say, 100 vehicles before having to refill the hydrogen supply on board the vehicle. And tell me about the infrastructure needed to do that, to refuel the hydrogen fuel cells. And because I, we, we know that we're building out an infrastructure for EVs for, for charging. So what do we need to make uh, the hydrogen fuel cells and, and these applications uh, more common? Well, that's partly why we're doing it the way we're doing it, because putting hydrogen fuel cells into kind of the retail uh, environment where it would be used in, let's say, an everyday driver is a very difficult challenge to, to get that many hydrogen stations at all the points of convenience that you or I would need to feel comfortable about not having range anxiety and other things with the vehicles. But when we talk about these commercial applications, they usually have many vehicles that fuel at centralized locations. They travel on fixed, predictable routes. So you, you can plan for that and you can install hydrogen production and distribution equipment and utilize it to its maximum extent possible. So you don't have stranded assets that are fueling, let's say, one vehicle a week, which is what you could have if you're trying to build out a network for personal drivers. Um, you, you need maybe a station on a street corner and there just aren't enough vehicles there to fully utilize it, which is an expensive proposition for the company that's installing the uh, infrastructure for that. So we're trying to target those applications where it automatically already will provide value for the customers. And then to get the hydrogen there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can either use um, green hydrogen, which you can use electrolysis to take energy off of a grid that's either leveraging wind or solar. And, and, and that's a big advantage actually to the renewable energy grid because those are both uh, intermittent power sources. You can't plan on the wind to blow every day the same amount, or you, you don't get the same amount of sun load every day, especially when you start talking about seasonally. And so to really maximize the investment for renewables on the grid, you have to have a way to buffer it over possibly months, certainly for weeks. And so hydrogen is the way you can store large amounts of energy for enough time to allow that to happen. Then using electrolysis, you can take it off the grid not just at a central location, but you can take it off the grid in a distributed manner close to the point where it's being used. So now I've opened up a brand new opportunity where I don't have to rely on uh, expensive transportation or storage. Instead, I can produce the hydrogen close to where it's used, minimize the storage cost that brings the overall cost of the system down. So that's yet another way to do it. And then in the meantime, we don't have full availability of having, uh, let's say, green energy on all the grid around the country. So there, there can be bridging strategies. And, and one of the things that we can do is like gray hydrogen, where we can use uh, methane, steam methane reformed um, natural gas. And, and this, is a, this is a great way to take um, already greener technologies, even though natural gas is still a petroleum related fuel, but it could be um, actually cleaning things up by not just finding a more efficient way to use it, but it could also be taking recovered natural gas that comes from methane that's coming from uh, landfills or wastewater treatment plants. And rather than letting those go and vent into the atmosphere, we can capture it and turn that into green hydrogen. So that's actually a very positive way of, of using those sources of energy. What are the chief obstacles that you need to overcome here to, to achieve all this? Well, um, today we're already seeing applications where the hydrogen fuel cell can, can provide a, a cost of ownership advantage for some of these, these different markets. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is just um, having some stability, um, knowing how the, how the rest of the, the, uh, the industry is going to be building out and coordin coordinating it. So we make the hydrogen fuel cells, we're working with partners to put those systems into um, their, their product, whether it's a, a locomotive or a class eight truck. Um, so there's a lot of other players involved with it, whether it's the grid operators or the, or the companies that are investing in electrolysis or uh, storage and distribution and dispensing, all of those different technologies and trying to get kind of this whole cast of characters together and moving them to get the technologies to bear in the right place at the right time 
know, that's that's part of the challenge. So, um, you know, it's it's manageable, but it's it certainly takes uh, a lot of effort in the early days when it's not it's not everywhere that you can just drive up to a street corner and find hydrogen. But really, we faced this before. Um, you know, it, it wasn't too many years ago that I can remember uh, diesel engines were gaining in. Uh, some segments like pickup trucks for popularity, and you couldn't really find diesel fuel uh, in a convenient way. People were going to the truck stops to refuel their diesel pickup trucks. And actually, a lot of people thought that that was going to be the restriction on the growth of diesels in that market. But if you look today, um, you know, you find diesel fueling stations at all of your corner grocery stores and and uh, plenty of convenient places. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm I'm driving a diesel pickup truck in this. I'm sitting in the in the seat of one right now, so it's uh, it's very easy to find. And so, you know, as the the popularity of the propulsion system increases, then there's demand. So then you can you can get the investment in the infrastructure, and it's kind of a, a self fulfilling uh, strategy that way. So the economics you're saying can make sense for this. Yes, yes, they can. And there's already, there are examples already where that's the case um, and it's started to mature. One example is in forklifts with hydrogen fuel cells. So a lot of, um, a lot of plants that are, that are using forklifts, they actually get a lower cost of operation by switching from battery electric forklifts to hydrogen fuel cell electric forklifts. And they're, they're using these distributed um, centralized refueling models that I just kind of outlined for the big trucks and they're applying it in uh, storage areas like warehouses or in factories. And what's, what's really interesting about this is as you've leveraged the factories and the warehouses, the other vehicles that always come into play with those locations are class A trucks. That's where you're getting your deliveries to or from the door. And so you can start to leverage that same investment for the forklifts to give you one of the points of fueling for the trucks. And the other places the trucks go are places like rail yards and airports. And uh, those are other very interesting applications for hydrogen fuel cells. So you can start to, to get some um, duplication of benefits by those single points of, of fueling where you can actually support multiple modes of transportation. Are you saying that uh, uh, a hydrogen fuel cell powered truck, uh, the big trucks that we're talking about, they make more sense than, than the EVs that uh, a number of companies are working on? Well, not for every application. And, and this is actually one of the things that makes me really happy with working within the strategy that GM has, has established because we're very strong in the Altium battery technology. That, that we're a leader in, in, in that technology. And we're also a leader with the Hydrotech fuel cells. So that puts us in this position where we don't have to try to force let's say batteries into every application because that's all we have. And we don't have to try to force fuel cells into every application because that's the only propulsion system we have. Instead, we can start to look for what best serves the customer and we can blend these technologies in an appropriate way. So the customer's not disadvantaged. They actually have their pain points addressed and we can solve problems for them. And that, that means that for some applications, some customers, you know, last mile traveled with light, light cargo, um, that would be a very good application for electrics that use batteries. I wouldn't argue to put a fuel cell in them at all. But if you start going to heavier and heavier payloads, longer distances, um, multiple shift operation where you can't afford to leave the vehicle charging for long periods of time, you know, these are all applications where the battery finds its limit and you start to actually benefit by putting the hydrogen energy on in addition to a battery. The battery's still there because it's recovering braking energy, but it's much smaller, much more affordable, and it's also um, not compromising the payload. So as you put bigger and bigger vehicles on the road with batteries, what happens is you, you increase the size of the battery, the cost of the battery, the mass of the battery, and the charging time for the battery. And these can all be constraints that put practical limits on where it makes sense to put battery power versus putting hydrogen. For more information, where can we go? Well, uh, you can look on the GM websites um, and, and you, can, you can find, uh, if you just look up the, on GM's website, there'll be information on what we're announcing, some of the press releases that we've had on our different uh, collaborations with different partners. And um, as time goes on here, I think we're gonna have some really interesting things to talk about in the future using the, what builds out from this technology and our strategy. Again, it's called Hydrotech with a T-E-C on the end. Charlie Fries, thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you.